Yakuza Like a Dragon is the first installment in a long series of Yakuza games that drifts away from the classic beat-em-up combat style and goes into a turn-based battle system. Even though I did like the two previous games that I played, which were Yakuza 0 and Kiwami 1, I couldn't wait to try this one out since I am a sucker for turn-based combat. After completing the game casually, I knew I wanted to do a challenge run of this game at some point, so here we are. Today we will find out if you can beat Yakuza Like a Dragon using only Ichiban Kasuka. Now before we start, as always, let's quickly go through the rules of this one. First of all, only Ichiban is allowed to take actions. This means the party members are only allowed to use the guard command and not use any other actions. Since you can't remove them from the party entirely, this is pretty much the only possible choice here. No equipment on party members. We don't want our party members to function as meat shields at any given point, so they will only stay with their initial setup. Ichiban is the only party member that is allowed to have equipment on him. No use of healing spots and or restaurants. Those heal up the entire party, so they are not going to be allowed either. The exception to this will be storyline segments where Ichiban is the only party member at that time. The general rule is that we're basically not allowed to heal any other party members. And last but not least, no new game plus. Same rule as in pretty much every other challenge run up to this point. We start off a fresh file at level 1 for the full experience. Now with that being out of the way, let's get going. We start the game. Go through the opening cutscenes, including a quick time event that we screw up because pressing the correct buttons is overrated anyways. Get a couple of tutorials about how to use the battle commands, and that's pretty much it for the most part. We also stop by the pawn shop to buy some basic equipment. It's not really giving a lot of defense, but we want to stack up as much as possible early on already. Chapter 1, or generally the beginning, doesn't really give you a lot of stuff to do. It's pretty much just going through the scripted events, fights and cutscenes until we meet Adachi for the first time. Once in Chapter 2, Ichiban gets out of jail and also gets his favorite signature haircut and we're off into the next set of battles. Again, nothing really noteworthy going on here since it's basically the same as in a normal playthrough up to this point, so we skip forward to the point where Adachi actually joins the party. Together we go down into the sewers in order to get to Arakawa. Those are the first fights where we have more than one party member accessible. Like mentioned in the rules earlier, Adachi is only allowed to use the guard command and also not allowed to do perfect guard incoming attacks. The main means of damage at this point is the Tenacious Fist skill. Tenacious Fist not only is stronger than a regular attack, it also has the nice side effect that it can occasionally stun an enemy, which makes this quite a bit more manageable since the incoming damage gets reduced quite a bit that way. The biggest issue here is that Ichiban runs out of MP relatively quickly. Luckily a level up gives you full HP and MP refill, so those certainly come in handy every once in a while. Technically, you could just run away from all those encounters, but getting some experience on Ichiban is definitely not a bad idea considering some of the upcoming fights. We also pick up the hardball on the way. Battle items at this point generally do quite a bit more damage than regular attacks, so it's good to have them available in case we might need them later. The fights generally drag on for quite a bit since the game expects you to make use of Adachi and opportune attacks to deal high damage after knocking an enemy down. Once we get to the end of the sewers, there is a save point, as well as a healing spot. Unfortunately, we're not allowed to use that, so after saving the game, we have to continue on with the current HP that we got. After the fight against the security guards, we pick up the stretched shirt. This is also the reason why we bought a helmet and boots in Kamurocho earlier. Together with the shirt, we already have a full set of Ichiban, which makes for a quite nice damage reduction. The upcoming Omi members can deal a decent amount of damage with the gun or the knife. Luckily, the companions are usually one shot with a tenacious fist, leaving only the big guy left in battle. Other than occasionally healing through here and there, there isn't really much to pay attention for the most part. Once we get through the Omi fights, we get discovered by the police, Adachi tries to stall for some time, and we continue on alone again. Since Adachi also left the party, we are allowed to use healing spots at this point, which is pretty much perfect timing since Ichiban barely has any HP or MP left at this point. 
We go through some more Omi guys and hope for a lucky stun. Before approaching the boss, we pick up the items that are on the way and also go back to the healing spot one more time to heal up to full. With that, we are off into the first actual boss fight of the game, Captain Savashiro. Again, this battle isn't anything special for the most part since Ichiban is alone during this segment anyways. We throw out Tenacious Fists and make some use of the environment around every once in a while for some extra damage. I did save the hard ball we got earlier for this battle, but during the course of it, it became pretty clear that we won't need it here, so I decided to save it for later. We actually got through the entire fight without having to heal a single time. Once our Shiro is down, we storm into the meeting, Arakawa shoots Ichi and we're already off into chapter 3. We get to meet Namba, go through the cutscenes in the hobo camp and learn how to treasure hunt from all kinds of places. This is going to be pretty important early on since we don't really have any way to acquire money at this point. We also get introduced to Canquest. Unfortunately, most of the prizes here aren't really useful or require a ton of points. The only noteworthy thing here are the Persona 5 CDs. Those don't really do anything, but it's Persona, so yay! Shang and his buddy show up in the hobo camp, Ichi gets discovered and headbutts the guy out of his shoes, and we are off into the next fight, now with Namba on our side. Again, Namba is only allowed to guard, so Ichiban has to take care of things alone. Just like before, we make use of Tenacious Fist to get through the fight. Shang's buddy just barely survives two attacks before going down to the third. Afterwards, we focus on Shang, again making use of Tenacious Fist until he's down. Since the enemies spread out the damage rather evenly between the two party members, we didn't even need to heal in battle yet again. We learn about the Ichi in 3, Kazuka finds the counterfeit bill in his pocket, we collect our stuff from the box and start exploring the city. Since a lot of the map is still blocked off at this point and there are no side quests available yet, we head straight to Hello Work, while raiding all vending machines on the way for some easy money. At Hello Work we get rejected since we're hobos, but luckily we get a job offer from a random guy standing around there. He offers us a job at a nearby bar, so off we are to the next section of the game. On the way there, we trigger the first couple of side quests, the most important one being the pawn shop. Gomi, the pawn shop owner, is actually rather tanky but doesn't do a lot of damage, so after a couple of tenacious fists he's down and the pawn shop is now open for business. The pawn shop is the only place in the game where we can sell off unneeded items, so this one is pretty important, especially early on when money is tight. Unfortunately, raiding the vending machines didn't really give us anything good, so there isn't much to sell off at the moment. On the way to the bar district, we stop by Popo to buy a couple of items. MP regeneration is rather expensive at this part, so we go with Saki in the beginning. Those heal 50 MP and are much cheaper, but they do make you slightly drunk, which usually isn't really an issue unless you drink several after each other. In the bar, we meet Hamako, the woman who hired us. We basically have to protect the bar from the Gaumichul, and after a nice chit chat, somebody comes in with a sledgehammer. We stop him, and literally one tenacious fist is enough to take him out already. We watch the rest of the cutscene, get our 5k reward, as well as the silver safe skeleton key. With this one, we can now open up all silver safes spread out in town. On the way home, we also stop by the soup lady. The side quest here is not available yet, but she does give us free soup. This one actually heals for 150 HP and considering it's free and you can't get one semi-regularly, this is actually really good. The following day we visit Hamako for our next job, which is basically cleaning the place. After a couple of more cutscenes, we run into Bleach Japan and their leader, Kume, for the first time. Once nine time approaches, our new buddy Kume returns and we're already off into the next fight. Even though this is a battle against six enemies, it's really not a big deal since they don't do a lot of damage and almost all of them go down within a single attack. Shortly afterwards, Adachi rejoins the party and we're off towards the next part. Now, I was thinking of grinding a little bit here to get the freelancer job to rank 6 for an extra plus 5 agility, but Ichiban was still rather far off and enemies don't really give a lot of experience here, so we skipped that part. We discover the self-proclaimed hero's bed and Ichiban becomes a hero. 
With that, we also finally get access to the first AoE spell, Mega Swing. We immediately put that to use to take care of the encounter that happens right afterwards. Mega Swing hits all enemies near the target, so you want to try to lure them together as much as possible. We go back to Hello Work, go through another fight, and get our next job assignment. This time at a soap land. Before that though, we run up all the way to West China East Station, where three silver safes are hidden. They contain a weapon for each character, but the important one here is the Rough Lumber, which is a rather strong weapon for Ichiban at this point. We try to continue on with the main story, but get distracted by a Degenerate before reaching Otohime Land. This one resists bad damage, but since he practically deals no damage at all, it's still not a big deal. We meet the Tsujimon Sensei and promise him to defeat them all before fighting the three Yakuza starters. Again, Mega Swing comes in real handy here since it pretty much always hits all three of them. Once the first one is down, we finish the other two with regular attacks and are off to Otohime Land for good now. Nonomiya, the owner of the Soap Land, tells us to go check on his top girl Nanoha. The fight after the cutscene, again, isn't really special for the most part. We use Mega Swing to deal some good AoE damage and finish the rest off with regular attacks afterwards. After not getting into Sunlight Castle yet, we are about to return to the Himalayan, but get interrupted by none other than Gary Buster Holmes. And with that, we get our introduction to Poundmates. Those are going to be very important for this playthrough. Gary Buster Holmes himself not only does decent AoE damage, but he also has a high chance to stun all targets in battle, which is a huge advantage to have. Right afterwards, we do the side quest where a Yakuza tries to steal baby formula from a man, which results in the party having to fight Yakuza in diapers. Again, we use AoE damage from Mega Swing to our advantage and clear up with single target attacks afterwards. Once Gondavara is down, we celebrate with him by chugging baby milk and get him as our second pound mate. This one doesn't do any damage, but he does an AoE attack and defense debuff, so definitely nice to have as well. Continuing on with the main story, we decide that the easiest way to get into Sunlight Castle is by taking job offers, so again we go back to Hello Work. Once in there, Ichiban gets to see what happens in the excellent area and we decide to invade the place the following day. Before doing that though, we make our first trip to the survive bar where we bond with Adachi. The drinking bonds themselves aren't really necessarily useful, but the dialogue gives Ichiban a nice social stat boost depending on the answer that you choose, and we need some of those stats in order to get access to some of the jobs as well as some hidden areas later on. The following day, we invade Sunlight Castle in the excellent room, punch the doctor in the face and get attacked by a couple of Yakuza disguised as guards. As always, one Mega Swing takes off a big chunk of their HP and we finish off with regular attacks afterwards. Tosca, the owner of the business, is not very happy that we're about to blow his secret and we get into the next boss fight. Once again we make use of Mega Swing to hit as many targets as possible. This time the adds do have quite some more HP too though. After two Mega Swings I started taking out the companions one by one with single target attacks. Once that was done, Totsuka is the only one left and he goes down relatively quickly as well since he's actually weak to bad attacks. After the battle, Ichiban decides it's best to just tell the Serio chairman about Totsuka's shady business tactics, so the following day we're off into the headquarters. Obviously the Serio were prepared and ambushed the party right at the front door. Again, we use Mega Swing to our advantage to hit as many enemies as possible. Unfortunately, they spread out a lot, so usually you won't be able to hit more than two to three targets at one time. Once Ichiban's MP are out, we take down the rest of them with single target attacks. Luckily, most of them don't have a lot of HP left at this point and go down in one or two attacks. I was hoping to get a level up here for a free heal, but unfortunately it was barely not enough, so we have to heal up using items. Luckily we bought some at Popo before coming in here. Next up is the fight against Aida. Again, we start Mega Swing away while trying to get rid of Aida as quickly as possible since he likes to call for backup. Because of that, we also make use of Gary Buster Holmes again. Not only does he do real good damage, but he also stuns all enemies so we can take them out much more conveniently. We continue making our way through the headquarters before running into Kazayama, the second of Totsuka's underlings. 
Luckily, this one is only one target, so we don't have to mega swing here. The big disadvantage though is that he guards the party's attacks relatively often. Once you cut through half of his HP, he starts to use Herculean effort and then charges into the party. This one actually deals a decent amount of damage, so a heal every now and then is definitely necessary. This is also the reason why we were only doing regular attacks in phase 1. Once the second phase hits, you want to take him out as quickly as possible. After the fight is over, we get ejected into the other part of the building and continue on there. Next up is Kikugawa, the last of the three underlings. Again, we try to get them together as close as possible to catch everybody with Mega Swing. The ads are quickly taken care of, so we can focus on Kikugawa himself. After buffing up his attack with Fighting Spirit, he will always follow it up with Cleave, which deals pretty big damage even on a perfect guard, so it's important to keep HP up at all times if possible. Other than that, it's just attacking until he's down as well. We continue on until we reach the chairman's office, and because this segment wasn't already brutal enough to begin with, we now have to fight all three of the underlings at the same time. We start the battle by using Gary Buster Holmes again. The stun from him is vital in order to get this battle done. Unlike in other battles though, we are not going to use Mega Swing here because we need to eliminate the targets in a certain order. We're starting off with Aida because he can actually heal the other two so you want to try to get rid of him as quickly as possible. Once Aida is down, we focus our attacks on Kikugawa because he's doing the big damage with his attack buff. Luckily he has lower HP, so after two more bat breakers, he's down as well. Kazayama being the last one left isn't really a big issue anymore. He is a big HP sponge, but luckily only deals rather low damage. The fact that he guards a lot is annoying since it prolongs the battle, but it's not really a big deal for the most part. After a while, we get him down as well, and the battle is won. We meet Chairman Hoshino, Totsuka gets kicked out, and Nanaho gets her money back from Takabe, so all is good, right? Well, not really, because once the party gets back to Urahima land, Nonomiya has seemingly committed suicide. At his funeral, we meet Saiko, Nanoha's twin sister. We learn that Nonomiya was probably killed by the Yokohama Liomong, and Saiko joins the party, so we finally have a full party of four people now. Too bad that won't really help too much. While crossing the bridge, we find a lost crawfish and decide to toss it back into the river. Unfortunately, the little buddy was the pet of one of the hobos and is called Nancy. So, we take a closer look by the river and actually find Nancy again. Before returning her though, we run into some thugs that try to mug an innocent man. After taking care of them, we get attacked by a man from part-time hero who thinks that we are in fact the thugs. Luckily, we just gotta level up before, so we can take him out with a couple of bat breakers. We join his little thing, so from now on we can take on part-time hero requests. Since the game puts us right into restaurant row afterwards, we can just continue on with the main story. After asking a couple of people there about Mabuchi, we get attacked by the Yokohama Liungmang. Again, we call our good friend Gary Buster Holmes for a nice AoE stun. This actually takes out a couple of enemies, so we only have to finish off the remaining ones with single target attacks. We see our old buddy Shang enter a bar and want to go after him. Unfortunately, we can't get in without a referral from a hostess, so Saiko decides to take one of the chops since her parents supposedly are Chinese. She gets a job interview with the manager and leaves the party temporarily. In the meantime, we visit the romance workshop for the first time. This place is going to be very important when it comes to weapon upgrades. Since we're still rather low on money at the moment though, there isn't much we can do at this point, so we just return to restaurant row right afterwards. In the bar, we run into a buddy Shang again and another fight breaks out. Mega Swing takes care of pretty much all of his companions, so we can focus on Shang himself after taking them out. Shang can fear party members, and of course he hits Ichiban with it right off the bat, because where else would the fun be? Fear is annoying, but not a big issue as long as your HP are somewhat up high. Once the fear wore off again, we make use of Bat Breaker and regular attacks to get his HP down to zero. After the battle, Shang tells us about Mabuchi's business, the Yokohama Trading Company, and we return to Hello Work to get a job there 
and in the process also unlock chop switching. Before going there, we still have a couple of things to do though. Since Ichiban's social stats are still rather low, the only new chops available for now are the Bodyguard and the Breaker. Since we don't really have weapons for either of them, it doesn't really make sense to switch at the moment. We still have Nancy the Clawfish in our possession, so we return her to the hobo, only to find out that Nancy was supposed to be the dinner the whole time. We stop him just in time, but in order to free Nancy, he wants some premium sushi. After grabbing the sushi, we stop by part-time hero's office again to get the first big quest here. The cats from the office have gone missing, so we need to collect them all again. We hand over the sushi in order to save Nancy and also unlock her as a pound mate. Nancy does AoE damage and also has a decent chance to poison all targets. This is going to become very useful later on since Ichiban doesn't really have any other ways to inflict poison on an enemy. We collect all the cats and return to part-time hero to get our reward, which is 1 million yen. Unfortunately, Robson, his first cat, has gone missing as well, so we need to find him too. We find Robson at Hamakita Park and return him to receive yet another million yen, as well as unlock Robson as a pound mate. Robson does pretty good AoE damage with a good chance to charm all targets, so yet again, another very useful pound bait. At this point, we also start taking pictures of the Kappa statue spread throughout town. This is yet another part-time hero request, which rewards you with another 2 million yen once you complete it. Since we also unlocked the first couple of chops now, we can start looking for weapons needed for those. The strongest weapons for all chops are generally acquired through upgrading certain base weapons at the Roman's Workshop. We start off at the Batting Center, where we can get the Red Anklet for the Breaker, as well as the Rusted Hammer from the Foreman in exchange for points. We hit a couple of home runs, buy the two weapons, and continue on. Two more weapons, the Table Sparkling for the Host and the Bulletproof Shield for the Enforcer, can be bought in the Gambling Hall. In order to get in there though, you need a confidence level of 4. Because of that, we visit vocational school and take the Underworld Studies exam. This one gives plus 100 confidence, which is more than enough to get it to level 4. Once we get into the gambling hall, we can buy both weapons for a total of 550 tags, which translate into 55,000 yen. The next weapon is the Nameless Katana for the Bodyguard, which we can get at the Shogi guy near the homeless camp. Unfortunately, this one requires us to play shogi, something I literally have no idea about. Luckily, there are guides out there, and solving the first puzzle shogi already gives us enough points to buy the katana. Technically, we could start upgrading weapons now, thanks to the Romance Workshop, but we won't do that just yet. Upgrading weapons is very expensive, and even though we got 2 million thanks to the part-time hero requests, those aren't really a lot considering the amount of money you need to upgrade the workshop and the weapons. Because of that, we return to the actual main story for now by going to the Yokohama Trading Company to get more information on Mabuchi. We also get interrupted by Bleach Japan again. Luckily, our good friend Mega Swing is a big help once again as we take out a couple of them in a single shot before finishing the rest off with single target attacks. Phase 2 of the fight now also has Kume in it. Luckily, Kume is weak to literally everything in this game, so after a mega swing and a couple of follow up attacks, the battle is over rather quickly. We also get to meet Eri for the first time, and this is where things are getting interesting. With Eri, we have now unlocked the business management minigame. This is literally the best option to make big money early in the game. Not only do you get Aerie as a party member once you hit the top 100 rankings, but you also get a good amount of money after each shareholder meeting. For now, we will only get into the top 100 to unlock Aerie as a character and see if that is enough to continue on with the main story. We return back to Roman's workshop to upgrade the hero's bat as often as possible at this point. Back at the Yokohama Trading Company, we find out that the Leomong are counterfeiting money. The party tries to sneak a bill out, fails horribly, and we get to fight the workers off. As always, Mega Swing is doing some real good work here. Once we've taken out the ads, we focus on the foreman. 
Our newly upgraded weapon is doing some good damage and the fight is over quickly once the dynamite blows up in his own face. The workers try to run the party over with a truck, we get a nice action movie explosion and the party wakes up hanging in chains with Mabuchi about to have some fun with them. Luckily, Chungi Han comes for the rescue just in time and we get to escape through the underground after fighting off a couple of workers. This is the first time we get to enter the Yokohama underground dungeon. There are a lot of encounters here on the way out, oftentimes with a good amount of enemies. Technically, you could just run away from all of those, but we want the experience, so we'll go through them all. Again, we try to stack up as many enemies as possible, and then throw a mega swing to get the most damage out. Unfortunately, oftentimes they spread out a lot, so mega swing is only partially effective here. Generally, due to the amount of battles and enemies, this segment is actually rather hard. We need to heal both HP and MP rather often, and since I didn't stack up as much items as I should have, we're getting close to running out of them towards the end. Once we made it through the first area, I made the first big mistake. Instead of using the save point, I opened up the silver safe first, and this one actually contains a level 20 shaman. This one oftentimes gets into attacks each turn, deals quite some damage, and also inflicts status ailments like cold. In fact, he actually wiped me and gave me the first game over in this playthrough. Since there is no autosave in the entire underground, we are basically back to the beginning, so we have to go through the entire thing one more time. Once we reach the second area again, first thing we do is save. This time we're prepared for the Shaman and can take it down without further issues. This one doesn't even give any experience, but it does give 10,000 yen, so that's something at least. We continue making our way through the underground afterwards. Like I mentioned earlier, the amount of encounters and enemies within those actually make this rather hard in this kind of setting. Strategies remain the same though. Try to pile enemies up, mega swing, and then finish off individually. Once we reach the end, we are stopped by the Excavator, the next boss fight. I was really afraid of this one after just barely getting through the underground section. Luckily, this fight was much easier than I expected. Batbreaker is dealing some very good damage and the incoming damage is for the most part very manageable as well. Once the crane is done, we finish off Yan with regular attacks and return back to the surface of Yokohama. Before we continue with the main story though, I wanted to upgrade Ichiban's equipment, especially his defense after what just happened in the underground dungeon. We only ever did weapon upgrades until now, so I looked into how to get Ichiban's defense up a little more. The easiest way is by acquiring the illegal boots. Those can be won by scoring more than 500 points in the advanced course of the Heavens Golf Center. So we do a little bit of golfing and roughly 15 minutes later we already ace the golfing courses and get our pair of illegal boots. Those not only give an extra plus 5 attack, they also have 54 defense. To put it into perspective, the boots I had before had 11 defense, so the increase is huge. They are actually the boots with the second highest defense in the entire game, so getting those this early is a huge benefit. With that defense boost, we return to the main story. Captain Takabe is on his way to Lee among Turf, so we go after him at the other serial. As soon as we enter, we get ambushed by the Yokohama Liumang. Again, Mega Swing is our best choice here. Due to the new boots, Ichiban barely takes any damage at all, so finishing those off is really no problem at all. Once the fight with Takabe starts, we call our good friend Gary Buster Holmes again to take out all the ads, or at least stun them. Since a lot of them are piled together, we can easily finish them off with a Mega Swing, and then clean up the others until only Takabe is left. Two bad breakers later, Takabe is already done, and we continue on. Shao takes Takabe as his prisoner until we prove Mabuchi skilled, so we're off into Gormichul territory next. We accompany the mysterious lady to the Gormichul headquarters. You can get the last Kappa statue here, but since you need to stand on the stairs to see it, you can't get the picture yet before completing the headquarters section first, so we dive right into that. As expected, we get ambushed by the Gomichul rather quickly. 
Again, we make use of our pound mates to help us get through the battle. Other than that, it's pretty much the same as always. Start off with Mega Swing and finish off with single target attacks. Once we reach the top, we run into Chiung Gi Han again. They explain how their civilian system works and how they make their counterfeit bills. Namba gets exposed as having spied on the Go Mitchell for months. They put a stun gun to him and we have to fight Chiung Gi Han now. Chiung Gi Han is the first bigger challenge. His damage against Ichiban, even with the new boots, is still rather high and pound baits don't really do much here. The biggest issue though is his poison shot attack. Poison ticks away HP every turn and curing it is pretty pointless since he's going to apply it again within the next few turns. Combine that with the fact that he oftentimes gets in two attacks each turn and we actually got a problem here. Two fatal rushes sealed the deal and we got our second game over in this playthrough. Again, there is no save point before the boss fight and the autosave is before going in so we need to do the entire segment yet again. Before going in I did want to upgrade my equipment but was lacking the necessary funds to do so. Because of that it was time to return to Ichiban Confections. After roughly two and a half hours of playing this minigame we made it all the way to number one. This not only gives Ichiban new skills, but with each shareholder meeting, Ichiban makes a total of 3 million yen. Going through that several times is the fastest way to make some easy money. In the end, we made a total of 44 million yen. This should be way more than what we need for now. We return to the romance workshop, upgrade it to the highest level, and continue maxing out our weapons. We can max them out all the way to the highest rank 3 level. Starting at rank 4, you need materials that cannot be bought at Hamakita Park, so we have to stop there for now. Additionally, we also craft ourselves a cyber armor, as well as a fable hat to boost Ichiban's defense significantly. With the new stuff equipped, we return back to the Gomuchul headquarters and fight our way through the enemies up until Chungi Han. Attempt number 2 went much smoother. Chungi Han's attack did a lot less damage now compared to before. Instead of using Batbreaker, we now go for our new skill Ultimate Stack Slap, which does real big damage. We still have to heal every once in a while because of the poison, but generally the fight was much more manageable now, and Chungi Han went down without further issues. On the way out, we have to go through a couple of more Gaumichol fights. Luckily, Mega Swing again takes care of things and since our weapon is upgraded quite a bit now, they go down rather quickly. After escaping, we take the last picture of Kappa statue and get our 2 million reward from part-time hero. We also visit the Camelop to trade in 25 of the Tojo Clan crests we found so far for a Brawler God's mouth guard. This one decreases the MP cost of skills by 20%, which is especially good for skills with high MP cost like Essence of Orbital Laser. We also finish off the Miracle Kimchi side quest in order to gain access to those. At this point I was just finishing off side quests for the sake of it, but I had no idea yet how important that kimchi is going to be later on. We also return to the Yokohama Underground Dungeon to get a couple of ranks on all the jobs. The regular encounters don't give a lot of experience, but it's enough to get the chops to rank 10 at least. Back on the surface, we also finish off the Mr. Masochist quest. This lets us use him as a pound mate. Mr. Masochist doesn't do any damage, but greatly increases your defense, so that is really nice to have. We return back to the main story and go visit the homeless camp to look through Namba's stuff to get an idea where he might have fled considering the Gomichul are looking to assassinate him. The party visits Heian Tower, we get some story time about how this entire thing came together and Chung Gi Han gives us a hint of where Namba might be. Bleach Japan. So we go to the Bleach Japan headquarters out of all things to not only find Namba in Kumbe but also Mabuchi and of course another fight breaks out. Mabuchi's goons are quickly taken care of thanks to Gary Buster Holmes followed up by a couple of single target attacks. Mabuchi himself luckily isn't a big deal either. Again we call pound mates but this time it's Nancy. Nancy has a chance to poison the target which is a big deal because unlike other status ailments poison does not wear off automatically. This means every time Mabuchi has a turn 
He takes damage from every action he does. As a bonus, he's also weak to water, so we can use the host's water skills to deal good amounts of damage to him. Once you push him past half of his HP, he starts using Crimson Aura to boost his attack. His attacks do quite a bit more damage in this phase, but as long as we keep our HP in check, it's not that big of an issue. After a couple of more attacks, Mabuchi is down, but both Kume and Namba escaped. Ichiban notices the picture on the wall, and the supposedly governor of Tokyo, Ryo Aoki, turns out to be the young master from way back in the game. We switch back to the hero job and go check out Hamako's place since a couple of Yakuza are on the lookout for the party and it turns out it's Totsuka once again. As always with the hero job, we try to hit as many targets as possible using Mega Swing and then finish off the remaining enemies with single target attacks. At this point we already upgraded our weapon to the legendary hero bat which not only hits twice on regular attacks, it also does electricity damage, which will come in very handy very often. We get a call from Shao that Bleach Japan is about to attack the Gomichul headquarters, so we make a deal with him to help them out, in exchange for Namba not being hunted any longer. We run into Kumi again, and luckily he's still weak to literally everything, so once we took out most of the enemies with Mega Swing, we can focus on Kumi again until he's out as well. After taking care of a couple of more Omi, we get attacked by a Wrecking Ball from none other than Ishioda and the next boss battle begins. Luckily, the heavy machinery is weak to electricity, so using Ultimate Stack Slap does real big damage here. Thanks to the equipment upgrades and the higher level, Ichiban barely takes any damage from the boss at all. We knock Ishioda out of the machine quickly and finish him off with a couple more Stack Slaps. This boss fight was much easier than I thought it would be, even more so considering this one gave me quite a bit of trouble in my casual playthrough. We also learned Giga Swing, which is a straight upgrade to the Mega Swing we've been using until now, so that's going to be quite useful as well. Ishioda wants to smash the party, we barely make it out, and use an underground passage to sneak into the Gomichul headquarters. We get attacked by Ishioda and his peers again, as well as Namba since we're trying to buy the Gomichul some time so they can burn down the entire place. We open up the fight with Robson who wipes literally every enemy but Ishioda which makes this battle a lot easier already. Even Ishioda himself is already down to 50% and since he's weak to electricity yet again, two more ultimate stack slaps and a regular attack already seal the deal. We make up with Namba and also kidnap the head of Bleach Japan, Ogazawara, to get some answers out of him. After we interrogated him for a while, we get attacked by the Omi again and they manage to rescue him. Chungi Han joins the party and we're about to rescue Shao, who seemingly is in trouble because of his own guys. Once we hit Restaurant Row, we get ambushed by the Leomong again as well as the returning Shang. We call our good friend Gary Buster Holmes who takes out the first wave of enemy before Shang himself joins the battle. One Mega Swing is actually enough to take out all his adds, so we can focus on him using Ultimate Stack Slap again. After slapping him around for a good while, Shang is down yet again, and we continue on. Again, we go through a couple of fights until we reach the restaurant and continue on there. The pattern is still the same for the most part. AoE swinging to do some good damage, and then finish off with single target attacks. With that, we make our way through the restaurant until we reach the VIP Lodge, where we get attacked by the manager himself. Again, we slap him around using ultimate stack slap until he's down, and he unleashes the tiger on the party. Unfortunately, the tiger is resisting bad attacks. Ultimate stack slap still does good amounts of damage though. The tiger can occasionally inflict bleeding on his attacks, which is annoying, but not really a big issue for the most part, as long as you keep Ichiban's HP in check. After getting sued by the WWF because we're hitting on wild animals, we make our way to the top where, once again, Mabuchi is waiting for yet another battle. We open up the fight with Robson, who once again takes care of everybody but Mabuchi. Mabuchi himself, just like Ishioda before, is weak to electricity attacks, so Ultimate Stack Slap deals over a thousand damage each turn. Only a couple of turns later, Mabuchi is already down and out. Since Mabuchi is out, Ishioda wants to take care of things yet again until Namba returns just in time to rejoin the party. 
not like we're going to do anything with him, but good for him, I guess. We open up the Shiota fight with Nancy to get poison on pretty much everybody. Afterwards, we take out the remaining ads with a swing and then focus our attention to Ishioda himself. Now, as you might have already guessed, Ishioda, once again, is weak to electricity. So we start slapping him around just like we did the last few times until he's down as well. Xiao is rescued and we talk to Hoshino about the Omi invasion that is about to happen. We try to get a little conversation out of Aoki, but get stopped by his guard. Two Giga Swings and a couple of attacks later, they're already down and out though. We meet up with Aoki at Odohime Land, Ichiban gets ambushed, but luckily his friends make the save and we fight some more Omi yet again. After clearing those with the usual tactics, we are into the next boss fight against Matoba. We start off the battle again with Nancy in order to get poison on everybody. The poison takes care of the remaining HP of the Companions, so we can focus on the boss itself, which, again, is vulnerable to electricity, so as always, we slap him with the stack of money that we got. I actually had to do this fight twice since I kinda forgot that Matoba can fear party members, which he did, and wiped Ichiban afterwards. Second time, I was prepared accordingly, and the fight was no issue at all. After that is done, we decide to head over to Sotenbori to invade the Omi headquarters, but we stop at the battle arena first. This is a great place to grind both for experience and also for items like equipment or upgrade materials. I am not going to go into great detail about each floor here because the strategy is almost the same every time. Throw out lasers until the enemies are down. Usually two Essence of Orbit laser get the job done and while it is rather MP intensive to use, it is by far the best AoE option we can currently use without having to rely on pound mates. After running through the entire arena all the way to the top, I decided that it might be time to give the next segment a shot and everybody that played this game before probably knows what's about to come up next. We run through Omi HQ and get stopped by a couple of Yakuza before the Dragon Chamber. Those are noteworthy, so we skip to the more interesting part. Majima and Seijima. I was not expecting to get through this battle on the first try, and I was right. In my first attempt, I tried using offensive skills that also boost my stats. Unfortunately, those stat-ups are not guaranteed, so it's really not worth having to rely on RNG in order to get them. Majima is extremely fast and can also paralyze using his attacks. Once Majima summons the doppelgangers, we throw out the laser. Unfortunately, a single laser isn't enough to beat them all, so we have to go through another attack before being able to get rid of them. With potential bleeding, paralyze, and the fact that Majima always gets at least two turns before Ichiba can act pretty quickly showed that we need to prepare a little bit better for this one. So again, we went back to the battle tower in order to get some experience. I got pretty much every job to roughly rank 14 or 15 because those were rather quick to get and you also get some nice static stat boosts from them. We also grinded some more money at each bank confections in order to be able to upgrade the weapon some more before going back to Omi headquarters and do the entire thing again. Now that we know what to prepare for, we can also further adjust Ichiban's equipment a bit better. We put on the insulated innerwear in order to be immune to paralyze as well as the Congo chainmail, which not only gives plus 20 defense, but also 16% resistance to blade attacks. Another thing I completely forgot about was a certain status item from way back in the game. The Miracle Kimchi. The Kimchi greatly increases your turn speed and is one of the very few ways in this game to do so. Combine that with the much higher resistance against blades and this attempt went much better than the first one. Once he summons the doppelgangers, we call Robson this time because I think I thought I remembered doppelgangers can actually be charmed. Well, Robson did so much damage that he one-shot all of them, so that wasn't even an issue anymore anyways. Another ultimate stack slap puts Majima's HP down far enough for Seijima to join the battle. We call some more backup in the form of Gondavara to reduce their attack, as well as Mr. Masochist to increase Ichiban's defense. 
Unfortunately, they still do rather big damage very fast, so we die again after the kimchi ran out at a very bad time. On attempt number 3, I noticed I still had guardian waters, which increase your defense by 3 stages, so I threw one of them on briefly before Seijima joined the battle, and this might have been the winning strategy. The amount of incoming damage was now quite a bit lower, so we can start doing damage occasionally by throwing out a laser. It is still rather hard though, keeping up your buffs while also doing damage and occasionally healing, which towards the end almost cost me as pretty much everything ran out at the same time. Luckily I was able to recover from it and blow Seijima away with a rocket launcher. After that, the battle was pretty much won. Heal up again and throw the second rocket launcher at Machima for the win. After the battle, we get some contacts from Arakawa and Tochima and prepare for the big meeting the next day. Both the Omi and the Tochu get the solved, people are running wild and we fight some more Omi. Again, we throw a laser to wipe almost everybody and pick up the remains with ultimate stack slap. We return back to Ichinchu afterwards, have a nice chit chat with Arakawa and he gets killed just a couple of hours later. Since this is probably Aoki's doing, we want to get more information. Conveniently, Kume is campaigning in Ichincho, so Ichiban decides to do the same to be able to get close to him without big issues. We laser off some more Omi, and just as we get close to Kume, we hear that Chairman Hoshino is in danger, so we head to Seryu headquarters. Unfortunately, the party is too late as we meet Sawashiro there with an already murdered chairman, so naturally, the next fight against Sawashiro is up. The Sawashiro fight has three phases. In phase 1, he deals blade damage with his katana. Once you get him down to two thirds of his HP, he switches over to the cane, which does blunt damage. Towards this point, we also start increasing our defense with guardian waters again. Since you can only carry five of those at a time, you want to make sure to use them accordingly. Once he gets into his last third, he not only does do both blunt and blade damage, but also starts using Vile Enlightenment occasionally. This heals for 1000 HP every time he acts. And he's fast, so that is actually a big problem. Luckily, after the second time he used Vile Enlightenment for big healing, he stopped doing it, so we were able to slap him around until he was down. We get some more backstory on Sawashiro, the Arakavas, as well as on Ichiban himself, before handing him over to the police. The next day, we beat up a couple of more Omis until Ichiban gets stopped by Kirio. He knows about Aoki's next move, but he won't tell us unless we prove our worth, so of course, we have to fight him. I went into this fight fully expecting to not have a single chance first try, and I wasn't too far off. We started off with the same strats as always. Kimchi to increase speed, and Nancy for poison, which actually got to stick first try. Kiri is one of the few bosses in this game that actually resist electricity, so we switch over to the Ice Spreader character skill from the host shop for damage this time around. Once Kiryu switches into Rush style is when this battle really starts to pick up. Not only does he cleanse himself of all status ailments, he also gets two, sometimes even three attacks in every turn and the uppercuts do like 180 damage, even on a perfect guard. Basically at this point I had no chance at all and went down rather quickly. I did try to set up multiple times with both the hero and also the host since that shop has more agility and also boosts cold damage from the ice spreader. The biggest issue was the combination of both speed and strength. I couldn't really reduce the amount of turns Kirio gets, so I started looking at ways to reduce the incoming damage. Unfortunately, there aren't really any accessories that give a good amount of blunt resistance like we had in the Majima fight with blades earlier. With all my equipment, I can get up to roughly 20% resistance, and while that is a nice boost, it's nowhere near enough to get me through the fight. At this point, I was pretty much ready to grind my butt off to even have a chance in this one. But then I noticed something. While comparing the jobs, I also took a look at the breaker, since this one generally has very high agility. What caught my eye, though, was that the breaker chop naturally has a 30% blunt resistance, meaning that by just assigning this chop, 
I already cut the entire damage from Kirio down by almost a third. Combine that with the equipment from earlier, we get a whopping 52% blunt resistance, which means each attack does less than half of the damage compared to the first attempt. With those changes, we're going back to Kirio one more time. Ice Spreader is only doing roughly 100 damage per hit anymore due to the lower magic, but the real difference maker is the amount of incoming damage. This became apparent when we hit phase 2 with the Rush style. The uppercut that used to do 180 damage is cut down to roughly 80 damage on a perfect guard, and that is even without using any means to increase my defense either. This battle is still rather hard, but with those changes it became beatable, so again we're chuckling around ice spreaders, heals, add miracle kimchi to keep the turn boost up while slowly getting his HP down further. Once his HP is down to half, he switches over into beast mode, which was probably the phase I was most afraid of. Luckily the regular attacks only did as much damage as his rush style, even the beast throw only did around 100 damage. So we continue on like in phase 2 until he's down to his last quarter, where he switches into Dragon of Dojima style. Since the incoming damage stays the same for the most part, we keep on chuckling out turns like we did before. I could have used the rocket launches at this point, but since the strategy used to this point worked so well, we just continued on like this until Kiryu was down and the fight was won. We get a nice little cutscene with Ichiban trying to slay a dragon before Saiko slaps him awake again. Shang Hui tells us that the Omi hired an assassin called Mirror Face to take out Sawashiro, and since they are near the bar district, we go there as well to make sure that's not going to happen. As pretty much every other time, we take out a couple of Omi on the way, using our big laser and cleaning up whatever remains afterwards. We meet Mirror Face. Ichiban can easily tell who the real Adachi is, and the fight starts. Now, admittedly, after getting through the Kiryu fight, I did underestimate this one quite a bit and it came back to haunt me rather fast. The strategy is pretty much the same as in the fights before. Throw a Miracle Kimchi turn 1 to increase the turn count, and then try to stick poison with Nancy and do damage with the laser. Unfortunately, I forgot that Savashiro does a scripted AoE fear attack halfway into the fight, which is a guaranteed hit, so once that happened, the two of them gang up on Ichiban, and the fight was over quickly. Because of that, I equipped the Courage Pendant, which gives you fear immunity, and went in for another try. This one ended even earlier though, because Mirror Face used Killing Slash on Ichiban turn 1. Killing Slash does almost 400 damage, even on a perfect guard, and also poisons the target. This is one of the few times where poison actually works against me, and a few turns later we got the next game over already. Technically, I could switch over to the Bodyguard for an extra 30% blade resistance, but I didn't really level the Bodyguard that much, and the bodyguard is also one of those classes with the lowest amount of magic, so we'd have quite a decrease in laser damage too. Because of that, we equipped the Congo Chain Mill like we did against Majima earlier, since this one not only gives plus 20 defense, but also 16% blade resistance. We also switch around some of the equipment to boost both blade and bullet resistance, since Savashiro's guns can hit pretty hard as well. With those changes, we hit 30% resistance on both blade and bullet, so we go in for yet another attempt. Nancy this time actually poisons both targets, which is a nice damage increase considering the amount of turns both of them get. Luckily in this attempt, Mirror Face also used Surveillance a couple of times, which is basically a free turn since this does literally nothing. Once we hit the 50% HP threshold, we also start buffing our defense again with the Guardian Waters. Since you can only carry 5 of them at one time, I wanted to save them for later phases. We also make use of both Majima and Seijima in this fight since both of them do real good damage. Mirror Face using Killing Slash again almost caught me towards the end, but Ichiban barely survived and after healing up, we finish off the fight using good old Robson, which actually takes care of both of them. After the fight is over, the place explodes and we hit the last chapter of the game. We have a nice little chit chat with Aoki to lure him in and could technically enter the final dungeon now. 
Before that, there are two things left to do though. First of all, I stacked up on recovery items big time. Once you enter Millennium Tower, there is no going back anymore, so you want to make sure to have enough items with you. After stacking up the box quite a bit, we also switch Ichiban's shop back again to the Breaker. Just like Kirio a while ago, Tendo is exclusively using blunt damage, so we can cut that down quite a bit by using the 30% natural blunt resistance of the Breaker. With all those preparations set, we are off into Millennium Tower, the final dungeon of the game. Now, the tower is basically a big climbing up segment while going through tons of Omi hordes on the way up. Since the strategy is here pretty much the same every fight, we're not going into much details here. Basically, throw a laser, clean up the remains, and then continue on all the way to the top. Before entering the final fight, we equip the Curse Substitute, which is probably the most important accessory in this entire thing. This one gives immunity to instant death attacks, and I'll explain in a few why that is so important. Ichiban also has a total of 54% blood resistance, meaning that all of Tendo's damage is more than halved. On the top floor, we meet the already mentioned Tendo, and after everything we've been through, the final boss fight begins. Well, technically not final, but I'd consider Tendo the final boss, so I guess that's still okay. The start of the battle is the same as pretty much always. Throw a Miracle Kimchi to increase turn speed, and then follow up with Nancy for the poison. Luckily we got it to stick first try and this is actually a rather big thing since Tendo is extremely fast. The biggest surprise of this entire thing though was the amount of incoming damage. Tendo did basically no damage at all with his phase 1 attacks. He only does about 30 to 50 damage. Even with the amount of attacks he gets between Ichiban's turns, this really isn't a big issue at all. Luckily, Tendo is also weak to electricity, so the laser does some real good damage as well. I also tried a physical attack once, just to see how much damage that does, but since the breaker does fire damage and Tendo is also resistant to those, that one barely even scratches him. Because of that, we continue lasering him while healing up and reapplying the kimchi when needed, and let poison do its thing until we get his HP down to 50% and hit phase 2. In phase 2, Tendo gains access to a couple of new tricks. He can either raise his left arm or his right arm and depending on which one he raises, he's going to follow it up with a special attack afterwards. His right arm attack, God's right hand, has a high chance to insta-kill the target which is why we equipped the curse substitute earlier. So this attack is almost like a free turn because of that. The second special attack is called Devil's Left Wing and deals very high damage to the target. At this point we also start throwing Guardian Waters to increase our defense even further. Because of this, the Devil's Left Wing only did about 80 damage. With these things out of the way, the fight was pretty much won, so we continue throwing out lasers, while keeping our defense and speed buffs up, and also heal occasionally when needed. Poison also did its fair amount of damage in this fight, in fact, I think actually the poison damage might have done more than the lasers, just because of the amount of turns Tendo gets, so it's only fitting that the fight ends with a poison tick. Tendo is down, Aoki storms into the room with lots of Omi guys at his side, and we get into the next fight right afterwards. Most of the Omi are taken care of with a single laser, which also happens to be the weakness of Aoki, so he takes quite a bit of damage from that too. Basically at this point we juggle MP healing and lasers until Aoki's down and runs away. We chase after him, have another little conversation, and the last fight of the game begins, even though this one is only a technicality at this point. Aoki, or Masato, whatever you want to call him, barely does any damage at all, so we go back to using ultimate stack slap here until he's pretty much done. We get through the last couple of quick time events, Masato crashes down, the fight is over and the challenge is completed. We watch the remaining cutscenes and the question to can you beat Yakuza like a dragon using only Ichiban Kasuga can be answered with a big yes. Once again this has been a very enjoyable challenge run. 
when I started this, I had no idea how far I can get with this one, especially with some of the later boss fights taken into consideration. With that being said, I am very happy it turned out the way it did. With that being said, that is it for me this time. Thank you very much for watching, take care, and I hope I see all of you next time as well.